Hello, it's um, Mr. T here. This is my third video on how to carry out a titration. In this video, um, we're going to carry on from where we've already looked at how to make a standard solution and to uh, transfer the correct amount of unknown solution into the conical flask. Right, so the first step we need to do is make sure that we rinse the burette. The burette that we're going to use for this titration may have had other solutions in before. It may have had some uh, different solution or it may have had distilled water as the last rinsing. If we don't rinse the burette with the solution we're about to put in it, the solution we put in the burette would be diluted by any distilled water that was still in there or it would be contaminated by anything else that was still in there. So we fill the burette with the solution to be titered and we rinse it. So usually that means, uh, that entails us uh, filling it about a third fill. We take it off the clamp stand, uh, we hold it horizontally, and we swirl it around in the same technique um, that we looked at with the pipette. Once we've done that, we place the burette back in the stand and we fill it with the solution that we're going to titer. Now one thing we need to notice is that if we look at this point here, in our, uh, the bottom of our burette, we can see that there's actually a bubble sitting here. Now this is quite important that we get rid of this bubble at the start of our titration because it could randomly uh, come out at any time and cause us to have an incorrect volume in any one of our titers. So what we do is we take the uh, full, full burette off the clamp stand and we tip it horizontally. Now, because of the uh, how thin the burette is, the solution does not flow out that easy, so this is it's quite safe to do this. We hold it on its side, and then what we do is we turn the tap a little bit and we drip um, the solution out the end of our burette, and what happens is the bubble will come out uh, when we hold it close to the horizontal, and this means that our burette will no longer have any bubble on the bottom part of it, and we're ready to start our titration. Okay, so once we've rinsed the burette, we place it back in the stand and we're ready to do our actual titration. We've got our conical flask with our um, solution in the bottom. In this case, this is our standard solution, our sodium carbonate. We know what its concentration is, and I've worked, I've added a, a specific amount using pipette and some indicator solution. In this case, the indicator solution for a start is colorless. So I'm going to add from the uh, burette here. I'll, for first, I'm going to take the initial volume, which is uh, 4.0 milliliters. So I'm looking right at the bottom of the meniscus and where it lines up with the scale on the left here. So that's 4.0 milliliters. Um, I'm going to add the acid that's in here until... I see a change in the color of my indicator here. Um, when I see the change in the indicator, it means I've added exactly the right amount of acid to neutralize the base. The, uh, we have a, a ratio of moles that are going to cancel out each other and we'll have neutralization. At that point where it changes color, that is called the end point. Okay, when we reach this end point and change color, we again read the volume. So the volume here at the moment is halfway between these two uh, lines on the scale on the left here. So I'm going to measure that off as 19.5. So now I know my initial and my final, I can work out what the titer is or the difference between the initial volume and the final volume. Now we have to take care, the very first titration we do for any um, specific titration or um, overall experiment we're going to do is going to be rough. What usually happens is we, when we notice the color change, we've already gone past the end point because we weren't expecting it. So our initial one is rough, and uh, we're going to use this as a as a guide to help us with our further titrations. Just a wee aside here, this pink color here. Um, is usually associated with phenyl failing, and in this case, however, it, I've had a base, uh, an acid go into a base, so it, it shouldn't really go pink, but that doesn't really matter. Right. Okay, so how do we ensure 
that we're going to be precise when we actually carry out titration. Well, one thing we do is we look at our rough titration and we decide that now what we're going to do, we've got a titer of 15.5 mils. So I'm pretty confident that if I add something like 14.5, it will not have changed color yet. But if I add 15, it might have changed color. So what I would do is I would look at the scale, see where it is at the moment, it's at 19.5, and I would add 14.5 onto that 19.5. So 19.5 plus 14.5 gives us 34. So what I then do is I'm going to turn this tap on while looking at the scale, and I'm going to let the solution out until it gets to 34. When it gets to 34, I'm going to turn the tap off and I'm going to add one drop. And then I'm going to swirl the conical flask. If it doesn't change color, I add another drop and then swirl again. The key here is to add one drop at a time when we're within the last mill of the end point. This will make our measurement of the titer extremely precise and will give us a value that's very close to the true value. So I do that and I get a value here of 34.5 and notice my next titer value is a bit smaller than in my rough. I'm more confident in my this titer value and I'm going to call it one of the what one of the tighter values it's going to be tighter in one that I might include in the actual values um, that I will collect for the final result. Now how do I ensure that the values that I get for my final result are accurate and close to the actual value? Well I do that by finding concordant results or three concordant results. Three results that agree with each other, that are close to each other. Now, depending on what you're titrating, the concordant results can be very, very close together, or they can be reasonably close together. Um, in most titrations, you're looking to get values that are within 0.2 milliliters of each other, and we're looking to get three of them. So I would continue to titrate my result, so if you look here, I carried out five titrations, and it wasn't till when I got to the third and fourth titration, I must have made a mistake here, and it wasn't till the fifth titration that I ended up with three results that were agreeing with each other, that were concordant within plus or minus 0.2. These are the final results I will use to get the titer for this titration, or what is the amount of solution I had to add from the burette to neutralize the solution that was in the conical flask. Now to average this I take the three concordant results, add them up and divide by three and I get an average. In this case 14.93 milliliters. I need to change this volume into liters. With titrations, all of our calculations are done using liters, so any volume I have in milliliters needs to be converted to liters. Okay, so I now have this titration value. Well, I can grab my results from earlier, and um, so the sodium carbonate that I put into my um, conical flask, I pipetted in 10 milliliters, that's 0 0.0100 liters. I had earlier calculated its concentration was 0 0.049479 moles per liter. So this is my, um, this top line here of sodium carbonate is obviously my standard solution. It's a solution I know the specific concentration of and I added a volume of it into my conical flask. Now, because I, I, I know two things about sodium carbonate, I know its concentration, and I know its volume, I can work out its mole. And I can work out the moles by using the equation at the top right here. So remember, if I want to find N or the moles here, 
I just need to move the volume away from being on the bottom of this equation on the right hand side and since it's dividing on the right if I move it over to the left it becomes multiplication. So we get the moles or N equals the concentration times the volume. N equals C times V. So I can carry out and find the moles of sodium carbonate it equals the concentration times the volume. It equals this concentration here times the volume and I get a moles of 0.00479 mole. Okay, that's cool. I've now worked out the mole of sodium carbonate. Now this is where the magic happened, the next part. Because we carried out a reaction that was neutralization and we stopped exactly when all of the base was neutralized by the acid, we know that the ratio of acid to base is going to be the same as the ratio in the acid base neutralization equation. Now that will always be given to us, it's at the top here, and we can see the ratio of the moles by looking at the coefficients in front of the acid and the base. We can see here that one sodium carbonate reacts with two hydrochloric acids. So the ratio is one sodium carbonate to two hydrochloric acids. If I had 10 sodium carbonates, I would have 20 hydrochloric acids. So I have twice as much HCl as I do NaCO3. So what I can do here is I can say, well, if I have sodium carbonate here and I know its amount, I know I have twice as much hydrochloric acid. So I multiply this by two to get twice as much and I put that value in here. So we've put down um, the volume uh, from our titer in here and um, the volume is uh, 14 millimeters 0.93 which is 0 0.01493 and um, I now know the volume of my hydrochloric acid and the moles of my hydrochloric acid so I can find the concentration. And that's what I wanted to do. Hydrochloric acid was my unknown solution. I didn't know its concentration accurately. I had an idea because I was told at the start of the experiment. So now I can find it accurately by multiplying, or sorry, by dividing. The concentration is going to equal the moles of hydrochloric acid divided by the volume of hydrochloric acid. And I get this answer of the concentration equal, equaling 0.0642 moles per litre. So that's basically that most of the calculations done. We've found out what the concentration is in moles per litre. However, one more step. If we want to check that the data we have is correct with some information we might have at the start. So often what we want to do is we want to also have our concentration in grams per litre. So we can compare against products that have stated their concentration and often when we buy products from uh, stores they give us the concentration in grams per litre so although chemists work mostly in moles per litre we need to change it in grams per litre if we're going to look at any commercial products so to change something to grams per litre from moles per litre we just multiply by the molar mass so um, in this case the molar mass of hydrochloric acid is 36.5. Remember that's um, the atomic mass of chlorine plus the atomic mass of hydrogen, which is 35.5 plus uh, one, because that's 36.5. So the, if I want to find the concentration in grams per liter, I multiply this concentration in moles per liter times the concentration in grams per liter, and we get the solution as being 23.4 grams per liter of hydrochloric acid. So I've got that number now and if I go and look on a bottle of hydrochloric acid that I bought from the local hardware store and it said it was 25 grams per litre, I can say, well, you know what, um, what I've worked out is the concentration you stated is slightly less, um, but it's very close. So I'm kind of happy with what I've done because it, it's, uh, it's an answer that agrees uh, within a small amount of error, but also maybe 
they're under over representing the strength of their acid so that's that's titration calculations done um i hope that hope that's helped and uh don't forget to go back and look at the other videos i have on um how to tie oh, sorry how to use a pipette and how to make a standard solution and if you like these videos um go and look at the other ones that i've done on organic chemistry um, and see if that helps okay thanks for listening